This is one of the better film noirs. Definitely more on the romance heavier side, lesser on the femme fatale side. There is no woman that is purposefully or even subconsciously trying to destroy people, even though Laura kind of is doing that in a way, but there's no real femme fatale in this film. There are a lot of the staples of film noir, the multiple points of view, the flashbacks, the black and white cinematography, the crime aspect, the hard-boiled detective. Just a lot of elements there that definitely uh, distinctly film noir. But what really makes it stand out is the mystery of it and that twist that comes in in the third act. She's not dead? Who thought they killed her? Before she comes back, you kind of have two main suspects. But when she comes back, suddenly everyone's a suspect. And for me, that's when the movie really, it went from really good to great. It wasn't just the twist of her coming back, but it's what her coming back did to your perception of everyone. Because now that you know she wasn't killed, but the model was killed. Now suddenly even she's a suspect. For me, that's what really elevates this film a lot. My only detraction, which we'll get into later, is I didn't love the ending, but this is pretty much an art toward film from Otto Preminger. So it was his intention that this was the ending. I didn't love the ending, but it didn't affect my enjoyment of it because they made these characters so three-dimensional in, in a kind of a way, even though they're like archetypes, even though you don't agree with their actions, you're more accepting of their actions if they feel like real people, as opposed to if they feel like they're just functions for the story itself. Maybe that character has bad decision-making process. Yes, I agree. Um, okay, that's movie. our review. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a great, great movie. I, I was uh, very surprised when you admitted to me that you hadn't seen it before, because um, I actually thought that wasn't even something we were uh, allowed to do when this podcast was pick a movie that we hadn't seen before. So I was surprised and amazed because, yeah, this is one of the great film noirs. And uh, I think I first saw it in a, a film studies class I took when I was young. And it was uh, definitely one of the films they, they used to show the genre and, and how good it could be. And, um, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I always remembered uh, from that first screening was uh, after a certain point in the movie, uh, it's kind of about a detective who becomes obsessed with this murder victim, Laura. He, he becomes obsessed and he stares at her portrait which is hanging on the wall and he imagines her and he, he hears everybody talk about her. And, and so in a way, it's kind of like he's falling in love with this dead woman and he's becoming obsessed with her. And, and there's a certain point in the movie where he falls asleep in front of her portrait. And uh, there are people out there who theorize that everything that happens in the movie after that point is a dream, that he's actually dreaming the rest of the movie um i don't really believe that i don't think that's really the case because uh if nothing else uh, i find that kind of dreaming uh problematic because there are plenty of scenes after that point that his character isn't even in so why would he be dreaming about these two women having a conversation in the bathroom for instance like it, it doesn't make sense to me it should all be from his perspective if the rest of it is his dream. And I think it's a little too simple uh, if that's if that's the case. And I think there should have been more of a reveal at the end, you know, like uh, maybe in The Wizard of Oz or something like that, where they kind of suggest it's all a dream at the end. The fact that there's nothing like that, I, 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 don't, I, just, I don't buy it. I don't think it's a dream. But it's an interesting theory, and it seems to be persistent. And a lot of people talk about that. Was that something that you had thought about at all? No, I could see why people would say that because the ending favors him in such a strong way. I thought he was a creep. I thought he was really <laughs> creepy. And for him to end up with her is just kind of odd. But I do think the movie needed a pivot point there because 
Pam and Laura were the main characters, but Laura technically wasn't in the film, even though she was in the film. It was mainly his story to tell up until that point. You needed to pivot from his obsession with her to the reality of her. And for the story to progress, you needed a pivot point. And that was that pivot point. And it ends with the furthest that story can go. Being in love with her, staring at her picture, and passing out drunk in her apartment. Aside from him digging up the body and we're going to see necrophilia, where else could that story go? So that part of the movie kind of ended where the only place it could end. He's in a drunken stupor, reading her letters, reading her diary in her apartment. Once you take it, the story and the character as far as it can go, if his character is going to still be in the movie, we need another direction for him to go in. And that other direction is now the reality of Laura. How would she feel about him now that she's real? Before, she was just a fantasy, a dead girl. I can see why people would say that, but the, for those reasons, I don't agree with that theory. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's interesting, but uh, yeah, I agree. I'll, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it could be a dream. And it's a perfect point, too, for him to, because he has kind of reached the end there, as you say, he's kind of drinking, he's doing things he shouldn't be doing. He's hanging out in her apartment. And yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, where's he gonna go from there? It's, yeah, you know, so, as so much as could... everyone would look at the, the movie and look at Waldo Lidecker as the creep, Waldo called him out on it. Mm -hmm. This is what a cop does. I'll take my things, you can take the painting of her. Like, why is he bidding on a painting of this dead girl? <laughs> What's reading the letters in the diary really gonna do for him? and buying her painting, like how is that professional on, on any level? I think there's a lot of sexual deviancy in this film. Of course, it has to be underneath the surface because of the time of when it was made. But you have Lidecker, when we're introduced to him, he's naked <laughs> in his tub <laughs> with this strange man in his apartment that he's never seen before. And he's just saying, hey, like, toss me that little towel to cover. Like, what's that towel gonna cover? It was like a hand <laughs> towel to toss him. And then he gave yeah. him his robe and the camera pans away, but clearly he's standing up naked in front of the detective who is looking at him. I haven't read up on the actor. I don't know if the actor is straight or not, but he certainly comes off as a gay man, the actor himself. And I think he plays the character that way. I don't, I don't think it's by accident we would question his sexuality in the movie. I thought his performance stole the show. Like he was, he was very good. Clifton Webb. I think he got an Oscar yes. nomination as well, well-deserved Oscar nomination. I think he came from the stage and this was one of his first screen roles. He had this relationship with Laura, but it didn't seem sexual in any way. All of the sexual tension came from when other men entered the relationship. So is this like his repressed homosexuality, like letting itself out? Because all he talks about is how ruggedly handsome these men are. Dude, you're like, you got issues, man. Let it out, man. Just like, you know, go to a bathhouse and, and do your thing. But um... <laughs> it's almost like a pig, Pygmalion or, or a My Fair Lady kind of thing where, you know, he's he kind of created Laura. You know, he found her when she was kind of nothing. And, and it's through him. And he gave her all of her, you know, in a way, her taste and her style. And he told her how to dress. He introduced her to the right people, you know. So in a way, it's like he's fallen in love with the statue that he created or, or, or you know, the painting that he created, or in this case, the woman that he created. But he's, he's, you know, it's almost he's in love with his own creation or something, you know. I don't think he's in love with her, man. I, I just think it was like he's in love with the guys. I think maybe he would have been happy if she would have picked the right guy, you know. I don't know if the right guy was him, but... I think, like you said, he created her like a My Fair Lady type situation. But I think his Frankenstein was supposed to go with a certain type of guy. She was going for the wrong type of guy. He wanted a guy like more distinguished like him. But I don't know if he was the guy. And if he felt that way about him, then Laura was kind of cruel. Because why is she stringing him along if there was nothing there? If he's really straight and she knows that he wants her, if that's really the dynamic of their relationship, she's openly flirting and dating men in front of him. And then she calls him out and say, like, you're the problem. You keep being mad that I'm with other guys. To me, that's like you come home and your wife says, 
I'm tired of you impeding on my dating life. You know, it's like, wait a minute, I'm your husband. <laughs> of course I'm going to impede on your dating life. So if they really had that type of relationship, like, of course he's going to get in the way of those relationships. It's just a very strange dynamic with those two. If he's not gay, it makes Laura look like the bad person. And if he is gay, then it makes more sense. Then you have the necrophiliac cop in love with a dead girl. And his behavior to me gets even worse when she's alive. He's bringing her down to the station just to find out if she's going to go back with her ex-lover. He's using the phone tap not to find out who did it, but he's just mad because she promised that she wouldn't call her fiance and she called her fiance. He's just so obsessed with her on a creepiest level possible. It just so happens that she says, okay, yeah, I'm in love with this guy. Their only interactions is him constantly badgering her about her love life, or she's the murderer. How do you fall in love with someone like that? And in the timeline of this movie, they've been together maybe like two days. And in those two days, twice he accused her of murder. He accused her fiance of murder. He badgers her about her love life. What in their interactions, in their very, very brief interactions, would make her fall in love with him? It just doesn't make any sense. It's just a lot of creepiness all the way around. And you have Anne Tridwell, played by um, Judith Anderson, great actress. Her relationship with uh, Shelby Carpenter, the Vincent Price character, you know, she openly admits, yeah, like, yeah, I'm older, like, you know, I'm not that attractive, but I have money. And I accept the fact that he's going to sleep with other women, but he's going to come back to me because I have the money and I can't have the version of him that I want, but I'll take whatever I can get, you know, and I've known people like that. They know that the person they're with wouldn't be with them if they didn't have something that they wanted and the thing that they want isn't you. It's something you possess, which is usually money. Sometimes it's other things. Um, sometimes it's holding their career over their head, like a Weinstein type situation. You have something that that person wants and you're going to hold it over their head and you're going to use that to get affection from them, you know, when you can, and you're, you're okay with that compromise type of relationship. And then you have Shelby, of course, the socialite who's just marrying into money, prefers someone attractive, but he's still sleeping around doing his thing. I just think all the way around, all these characters are just like a bunch of sexual deviants. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you're right. There, there are lots of people like that in real life. And I, I would say that uh, I've also known people who've kind of been in that situation where they are the sort of nerdy best friend of a beautiful woman, you know, a man who's not very cool, not very good looking, but he hangs out with this woman. She really likes him uh, as a friend. She talks to him on the phone all the time. But meanwhile, she dates, you know, good looking guys who aren't so smart. And, and she sort of gets her intellectual needs by talking to her friend, but then still wants to go off with these better looking men. So uh, it could be a little bit of that dynamic there. With Lidecker, that he is kind of the intellectual, the you know the the intelligent person that she likes to talk to, but she's attracted to these good-looking, you know, muscular men or whatever they are. You know, the, the cop. Who you're you're right. They don't know each other very long. And, and what would she have to go on, except maybe his looks, right? That's maybe all she. But is he really that much better looking than Vincent Price, a guy who she's already engaged to? Uh, well, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's for a woman to answer, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I don't know. I think the fact that there was never any conversation establishing, hey, Waldo, we're only friends, that was never said. We don't know the dynamic of their relationship, no, which no, makes it more intriguing. You know, sometimes yeah. less is more, and not explaining their relationships fully adds a lot more intrigue to this movie. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, I love Clifton Webb as uh, Waldo Lidecker. I love that character. I love his performance. And in a way, it's uh, a bit reminiscent of George Sanders in All About Eve, you know, this kind of intellectual character who's kind of a celebrity, right? He's, uh, Waldo is on the radio. And they're both like journalists too, right? Yeah, yeah, they're writers. Which they're, was a lot know. more of a big deal in those times. Before yeah. TV and the internet and things like that, it was journalists had a lot more power exactly and and these guys are both wielding their power in a way 
you know, to kind of get what they want. They're kind of using their their position of power. And uh, so there's a certain similarity there between those characters. And uh, what's interesting is that they apparently did a remake of Laura for TV at some point. And George Sanders actually played the Waldo Lydecker character. Mm. So <laughs> that's an interesting connection because I immediately thought of him when I, you know, this character just reminded me in a way of, of uh, the character in All About Eve. But mainly just that I love them both. I just enjoy listening to them. They say things that are clever and, and interesting, and maybe just a little bit offensive at times. You know. Yeah. I think they're they're great characters. Do we really think that she admires him that much? She admires his prestige, because that's how they first met. She's like, you could do so much for my career if yeah. you would just sign off and say you, you'll support this pen for my company. It's established right away. She wants his status to help her career. And then he even says in the montage, that's exactly what he did. She was very forthright. She's like, hey, you're who you are and you signing off on this pen is gonna really help my career. And I'd really want you to do this. And he's like, no, then he reluctantly says yes. And then in the montage, he's like, yeah, basically, I took her around. I helped her career. Do we really think that? Because that's what he said. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what he told the detective. Oh, she admired me. She thought I was smart and brilliant and clever and funny. The way he's listing off all these things that she says, do we see anything from their interaction that makes us think that she thinks he's all these things? When she's not using him, she's annoyed by him. She's like, oh, why are you torturing me like this? Why are you telling me these things? Why are you doing this? Why, 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 why? I don't know if she really likes him or admires his brains or his brilliance. I think he admires his brilliance. I think there's a little bit of hubris there where he's, <laughs> yes. just, he's the, the bee's knees. Well, he actually has a line about that, doesn't he? Where he says something like he's never found another subject worthy of his interest as much as himself, you know, something to that effect. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. I don't know. Like she definitely starts, you could say she starts from a point of using him in a way, using him to help her career. And then and you could say he's also using her, you know, as a young, beautiful woman, somebody he can be seen with or whatever. Um, so yeah, at what point do they stop using each other and start being real friends? I don't know. Did they ever? It's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if we saw a genuine moment between them. He's grooming yeah. her to be the socialite. She's using him to move up the ladder. We see the jealousy where someone else comes in on his territory. And we don't know if it's for a sexual reason that he's jealous, you know, of her. Mm -hmm. You also have Vincent Price. So Vincent Price had an interesting career. He started off kind of like a leading man. There's only so far you're going to get as a leading man because you're the star in a movie. Like how many movies are going to say, I'm going to forego Cary Grant, which just seems to be a staple of every podcast. <laughs> That's right. You know, Clark Gable and Gary Cooper, and I'm going to forego all these other people. And I'm going to have Vincent Price be the lead actor in a movie. I'm going to open to make a bunch of money. It's only so far you're going to go in that era because there were a lot of great leading men back then. So his career didn't really go too far from that aspect. But he did start off in stage, went into movies because he's tall, handsome, leading man. Then he became more of a character actor. He got a lot of supporting parts, and this is one of them, before he finally established himself. When he started to get to middle age, where he started to get into those horror movies, American International, those type of movies where he, he really became a household name. Then he went into yeah. a lot of comedies and tv and commercials and stuff like that and became more of like a social icon house of wax i think may have been where he really kind of became a horror guy in a way i think Corman. the shock may have been like his first like successful movie where he was the lead actor yeah and house of wax is what really put him on the map and then he got into the fly and other stuff like that yeah that's right yeah yeah, yeah. Judith Anderson, a good character actor. She was in Rebecca, a lot of great movies. Never really like the lead or anyone in the forefront. She's one of those really good character actors that's in a lot of stuff. I thought she was sneakily good in this movie, in her role. Despite limited screen time, she was really effective. That scene where in the, they're in the bathroom with her and, and Jean Tierney, Laura looks at her and says, you didn't. And she was like, no, but I could have. 
<laughs> you know, it's, like, <laughs> it's kind of like a weird thing because I think she's like her aunt in the movie. It's like a weird yeah. thing to say, like, no, I could have killed you and I thought about killing you. I didn't do it. <laughs> like, and then she walks away. It's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, like, I thought that was yeah. like one of the like creepiest scenes that like w was very understated because Laura didn't even react that much to it. What? <laughs> like, you're my aunt? <laughs> like, wait a minute. You know, yeah. like officer, maybe you should look at this, look into this one right here. You know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, she was good in this movie as well. Jean Tierney. I don't think acting wise, she really stood out. She held her own, but I didn't think there was a lot for her to do. I mean, there were scenes I just mentioned where I think a better actress, maybe like a Betty Davis would have played up that scene a little bit more. I think she may have been a little too understated. Those moments that were there for her to have a nice emotional reaction she just kind of underplayed everything a lot this was early in her career as well yeah. she wasn't really too much of a trained actress i think she was merely there she got in because of her beauty she led an interesting life i think she dated a prince she dated the president while he was married before he was president but while he was married um jfk i think she married in her early 20s i think her husband constantly cheated on her but you feel sorry for her, but then again, she slept with a married man that would go on to be president. So she kind of screwed another woman over as well. I think she had like mental health issues. She had like shock treatment, lost her memory. She lived to a pretty long time though. I think she died in her seventies from smoking, which is ironic because I think she started smoking because she thought her voice was too flinty in movies like this. And she wanted wow. the voice. That's why she started smoking, but ended up dying of like lung cancer or something like that. But she lived a pretty long life, interesting career. I think her love life was more interesting than what she did on screen. But her love life is probably very reflective of Laura in this movie. So maybe it was life imitating art. Yeah. I heard that she didn't really want to take this part at first because she she made a comment, something along the lines of she didn't want to play uh, a painting. You know, like the part is basically just a painting. And, and in a way, her performance kind of is like that. Like, she's kind of mysterious. You don't really get a sense of her. Like, when you ask questions of, it, does she really like this character or not? Or why does she like this other character? Yeah, we don't really know, because she's a bit of a mystery. She kind of is that portrait hanging on the wall. And, and other people put ideas onto her. But, um, yeah, I didn't feel like it was a really in-depth kind of nuanced performance it was kind of like she's a mysterious almost a cipher or something you know she doesn't really reveal a lot of inner going us on um do you think that she, was coming from preminger or do you think that was her being limited as an, as an actress uh the, well, that's another good question um i suspect that in some ways it's there in the in the intention of the, the film and i mean this was based on a novel I haven't read the novel, um, but, you know, it might be in there, too. I don't know. It could be part of the concept that she's a really mysterious person and uh, people just don't know. Um, but I, I suspect there's also something there. Like you said, a different actress might have brought something to it that would have had a little more character or something because she's really beautiful. She's very good looking, um, but we don't get a lot of very specific character moments from her, uh, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As much as I think the character actors really did a good job in this, Clifton Webb and, and Vincent Price, Judith Anderson, I still wonder like what a, a more dynamic leading actress could have done. Either go all the way with the, the detective character um, instead of a Dana Andrews, you know, Mark McPherson, that Mark McPherson character, maybe go with like a, a Cary Grant, you know, <laughs> <laughs> go with, uh, go with like a, a genuine, like handsome leading man where it's like, it's plausible that she would just be in love with him on first sight or go with a little bit more of a hard boiled grizzled guy, like a Humphrey Bogart. I thought the, the actors were really good, but I thought the supporting actors were a lot better than the leads. The leads were good. But the supporting actors were great. And I just wondered, like, with maybe stronger leads, how much different this movie would be, even though it's a it's a classic and, and well-deserved classic. Do you think I'm being too hard on the leads, or do you think they were they were um they could have been better? I don't know if you're being too hard on them, but I, I think it's true that 
both of them, both of their characters do come off as a, li a little bit um, mysterious or, or, you know, we don't get a lot from them. Like Dana Andrews, you know, you're right, Humphrey Bogart would bring something to it that would give us a lot more character. We would just get a lot more sense of him as a character. But Dana Andrews is kind of hard to read. You know, he's just, he's a cop, he's doing his job. And he kind of becomes obsessed with her, mm -hmm. but but I don't know anything about him other than that. Yeah, you know, I, I don't feel I really know him the same way. I don't really feel I know Laura or, or Jean Tierney's Laura. They're they're both kind of blank canvases in a way. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe different actors would have brought something to it that would make it even more interesting. But on the other hand, maybe this is part of it: is that you know we we you know we want to be left with this kind of sense of mystery. Who is this Laura? Who is this portrait hanging on the wall? And maybe we're just supposed to never know the answer. I don't know. It's interesting. I just think this is a great movie, right? Get, don't get me wrong. I love yes. this movie. I yeah. really enjoyed it. But when I look at this movie, I say, what's the difference between this and the Maltese Falcon? What's the difference between this and to have and have not? I think the direction, the cinematography, the music, the supporting actors, just as good. The difference is the lead actors. You know, I think that this is a great movie, but the only thing separating this from like an all time great movie is, is the leads. They were, the leads are, this is like a B movie. I think this was put together as like maybe a B movie Maybe it's maybe it was an A, but I think it it had the makings of just an all time classic, one of the top film noirs ever made. It was just like the leads; they they were good, and they were probably good for what the intention of the movie was. But it was just like, wait a minute, Otto Preminger, this might be his best movie ever, and he's already a great director. Vincent Price, this guy's pretty good; he may be a star. <laughs> You know, it's like, wait a minute, Clifton Webb, well, this guy's really good. He got an Oscar nomination. Judith Anderson, she's, we already know she's good. It's like, wait a minute, we got something here, you know? It's like, <laughs> and it's like, oh man, we're stuck with these leads. You know, it's kind of, <laughs> you know. again, I, I'm but, not talking the leads. I thought they were good, but I just think everything else yeah. was great. Yeah, well, I, I don't think I've ever thought to myself, I want to watch a Dana Andrews movie. Like, I don't even know what that would be. Like, I can't picture Dana Andrews as a, a category of movie, you know. Humphrey Bogart, yes. James Cagney, yes. You kind of know what you're going to see. But Dana Andrews, I've never thought I'm in the mood for a Dana Andrews movie. Yeah. And, and really, same thing with Jean Tierney. I don't think I've ever thought that about her. So I'll get into more of the positives. I thought the direction was great. The cinematography and the direction because you can't it's hard to mention one without the other because the shot composition comes from Priminger and then the cinematography is executing that shot composition but I thought the way the film was shot really played into the themes of the movie and that's what I love you can have a beautifully shot movie and then a well-written well-directed movie but they don't always intertwine and sometimes when they intertwine they intertwine because they're both separately great but to me, this is one of those movies where it's like, it's not just that they're both great, but that they both elevate each other in that this movie at the heart is a mystery. And it's an objective story where it's just like, wait a minute. Eventually they tell you who's the good guy and who's the bad guy and who she's really in love with. But for 90% of the movie, they don't tell you that. It just all comes rushing in at the end because you're talking about one of these these are the old Hollywood movies that have the old formula where there's really no third act. We're just act one, act two, wrap it up. For most of the movie, they're not telling you what to think. They're not giving you the answers. And the cinematography plays into that because it's an objective camera. There's not a lot of POVs. There's not a lot of close-ups. There's not a lot of cuts. It The camera's roaming. It, co it comes in, it comes out. A lot of two shots, a lot of wide shots, but it's not cutting in between twos and wides. It's just zooming in, pulling in, pulling out, panning across, panning across. And it's just letting you observe everything. And it's your call 
a lot of times where you're doing a lot of these cuts, it's the director telling you what to think. Oh, here's a close up. You got to pay attention to that. Here's a wide shot. Take everything in because, you know, there's going to be something here you need to pay attention to. He doesn't do any of that. It's just like you decide what you want to do. I'm going to follow these characters. I'm going to follow them around. They're going to have they're going to do their performances. A lot of times you're not going to get a single character in a shot. You're going to get mostly two people. And it's up to you to decide what you want. And I think that really elevated the mystery of the movie because you didn't know what character to 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 really believe in or to not believe in. And I think the very few times that he did go close up, I think it kind of backfired. We already know he's in love with a dead girl. We didn't need a close up for you to tell us that he's in love with the dead girl, you know? I even think the hand, the very few close ups they did, they didn't even need him. Well, I think one thing that uh, should be mentioned is the music, uh, particularly the theme, uh, Laura's theme, uh, which was uh, so popular. Uh, and apparently, uh, at first, Otto Preminger wanted to use an old song. He didn't want to have new music written. He was going to use an old song. And the composer said, no, that's, that's a terrible idea. And so I think Preminger gave him a few days to come up with something. And he came up with the iconic theme, which we all, uh, all know now as the theme from Laura. And it was so popular, people wrote in and they said, hey, is there a recording of this? We really want one. And uh, so they actually, Johnny Mercer, uh, the songwriter, he wrote lyrics for it. And it actually became a hit song. And it's been recorded by hundreds of people over the years. It's really gone on to become a real uh, jazz standard. So uh, that's something uh, that I think is worth noting. And it is a great piece of music. And it's very haunting. And it really works well, I think, in this movie as Laura's theme. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's one of the things that always stuck with me as well was that that piece of music. Yeah, evidently he had like a Dear John letter from his first wife in his pocket at the time, and he didn't want to look at it. Legend goes like this song kind of like inspired it, or it was inspired from that, or something to that nature. But that did have some influence in the writing of the music. And the composer was very outspoken too for a composer on like how the movie should be played out with the music and where it didn't need music and things like that. <laughs> so, which is kind of rare, especially in this time where producers and studio heads didn't even listen to directors much, much as for like a you know composer to to have a voice in the editing room. Yeah, and it's true he actually wrote less music for the movie than a lot of other composers would have. He felt very strongly that certain scenes didn't need music and in fact it would be better for them to not have music and perhaps that's why the music that was there really stands out so much you know it's just it, it's you know not it's not in a crowded movie filled with music so the it, it just kind of makes it all pop all the more the one weak point of the film aside from the lead actors could be better but that's just a casting decision from the film itself is the ending didn't really do it for me i thought irony would have been the best way to end this there were two endings that i think either would have been better than the ending we got and they both again hinged on irony and for me it would have been if laura ends up being the killer who killed laura but laura is the killer she ends up killing the other woman and there's motive for it you know here's this other woman in her apartment with her fiance. The other version would be if the detective who's investigating the mur murder of Laura ends up killing Laura. If she would have just viewed him as the creep that he actually was, you know, then maybe at the end she does go with, with the fiance and he's like, how can you go back with him? And instead of that speech she gave to the other character she would have just gave it to the detective you're being too aggressive get away from me like i don't even know you this is literally the third time i'm seeing you in my entire life and all you've ever done is just like badger me on my relationship and accuse me of murder why do you think i would be in love with you and how are you in love with me you've never seen me before you fucking creep <laughs> like you're investigating my murder like what the hell is going on with you you oddball and then he just loses it you know because we don't know much about him like he could have been this unhinged character just, just loses it at the end because 
we see he's playing with that little game in his hand, that little baseball game. And he says, you know, he uses it for his nerves. But maybe a shot of him like cracking the screen with his hand in anger. That was the only thing holding him together. And he just loses his nerve and he just goes in there, you know, sees her with the fiance and just blasts her. I think that would have been like really ironic, you know, but um, that's just me. Very dark yeah. thing. Not the, the romantic ending that we have, but either of those would have been a lot more interesting and it would have been a lot more ironic and it would have everything would have been pulled together like really well. Uh, well, it's interesting because uh, certainly we do suspect Laura for at least a good portion of the the final section of the film. We think, oh, maybe she's guilty because, because as you said, once she turns up alive, suddenly, oh, that can explain everything, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you do kind of wonder, and, uh, and that certainly would have been a way to go. Um, and I also kind of expected, in a way, that she would die. In the end because when you've got a character that's supposed to be dead and everybody thinks that they're dead uh you know that would kind of be somehow the final i don't know if irony is the right word but just you know we expect her to be dead and then she really is dead at the end you know mm -hmm. like it's, you think she's still alive oh this is great but oh no now she's dead so i i, I kind of expected it to end that way that she would wind up dead and it would have a more tragic Kind of feel like she was almost resurrected she was almost still alive and yeah. then she's dead so and then no I, one have her they yeah. all could have been there like all of the men that wanted her just standing there with none of them having her you could have even had the Anne character killer because yeah. you know uh it could have been that she was just jealous and she kills her yeah. you know her aunt kills her and that way none yeah. of the men are guilty for killing her but you see all the men that wanted her now none of the men can have her. She goes back to just being that portrait on the wall. You know, exactly. She's still, she's still the portrait, you know, and people are still in love with her, even though she's not a living person anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think her dying or her being the killer would have been a much better route than... Because I feel Waldo, again, I love the movie, but I think Waldo as a killer is just kind of lazy because they just pick the least likable character and then just have him be the killer. It's like, it's kind of lazy. <laughs> well, it's also, it's kind of an unusual noir in the sense that it's a fairly happy ending, right? Yeah. You know, the, the characters kind of wind up okay other than, you know, the, the killer. But um, yeah, you kind of expect that it's going to be darker, there's going to be more tragedy, and that more people are going to be unhappy in the end. Um, but, you know, in a way that's kind of good too because it's different. You know, you, you kind of expect it's going to happen and then, oh, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of kind of a nice surprise, I guess, that it's a somewhat more positive ending than some. Yeah. So, yeah, I can definitely see I can see your points about where where it could have gone and maybe should have gone. But at the same time, I like it the way it is. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I just and think it's a great, great it, there movie. There supposedly were alternate endings. And I think one is where um clifton is still the killer but she kind of knows and tries to help him get away with it but then he comes back to kill her anyway and i think there was like another one but it wasn't shot but i think they said that that one was shot i think they said there was an alternate ending that was shot and i think that was the one that shot but i think there was another alternate ending as well but with this type of movie it lends itself to multiple type of endings because the whole premise of it is anyone could have done it you know that's the whole thing sometimes when a movie has more than one ending it has no endings because it's just it's just bad storytelling they say good storytelling you should start with the end and work your way backwards but to me that's not always the case and this movie is the exception because this is an ending i don't like but i still love the movie and then there were supposedly other alter alternatives that the producers and director thought of that they didn't end up going with so it's like you know there are there are movies that can be great that doesn't fully hinge on exactly how the movie ends yeah totally i mean i i know i've said it before and i'll probably say it again that a lot of movies i find i really love the first half you know maybe the first two thirds and then once we get into the climactic sequence i start to lose interest because it's just oh yeah okay you know it's kind of funneling down to the ending that you expect 
and there's not going to be any real surprises but i really love the beginning of a lot of movies and sometimes the ending yeah i'm not crazy about it but it, i still really love the movie and in this case i i didn't feel that way i didn't feel like oh man you know the last 20 minutes are are boring i was still very much in the movie and i i, I still do quite like this movie uh, and I don't have a problem with the ending, really. Uh, but it's it's not uncommon for me to prefer the first half of a movie to the, the ending. Well, this movie's helped in a way in that it's structured in the old Hollywood style where there's no third act. If there was a full third act, you would have had 30 minutes of an ending that may not have satisfied everyone. The fact that the ending, you could take it or leave it, it doesn't hurt when the ending wraps up in like five minutes. This was a new structured movie. It wouldn't be under 90 minutes. It would be two hours plus, And that ending would have been protracted. And if you didn't like it, you'd have to sit through 30 minutes of an ending that you didn't like as opposed to five minutes. So I think that that yeah. helps as well is that the, it wraps up very quickly. So love it or hate it. Yeah. Have yeah. a lot of time to sit on it, you know? Yeah. Oh, it really does. And uh, yeah, you're right. Like it, modern movie there might be a big chase scene and a big fight scene <laughs> yeah the and minute then, you and knew who the after... killer was the movie kind of ends but in a modern movie yeah. after you know who the killer is you still have that third act to finish you still have 20 or 30 minutes yeah. after you know who the killer is for the movie to play itself out for sure yeah and, and you're kind of even in a movie like this i expected there might be a couple of lines of dialogue <laughs> but it really just ends you know they really they end it very fast Mm -hmm. faster than some yeah that's not that's how movies did it back then that's why i kind of like these these type of crime movies more, better than the newer crime movies it's not it's not just that they did it better but it's just that like sometimes once you know what the answer is you're ready to wrap it up you're ready to, to call it a day all right mystery's over wrap up your movie it's like you don't necessarily want another 30 minutes of movie once you know right. who the killer is in a murder mystery, you know, so, yeah. All right, yeah, definitely a high recommend for this one. Yeah, me too. Um, I've seen it four or five times over the years, and I could probably watch it again tomorrow, you know. It's just one of those movies I, I find it completely irresistible.